Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my impressions vlog for June 2018, and as you can see, I'm going to be covering six different games in this video, and I played all of these for the first time within the last few weeks, and here I will be talking about how those plays went and what I thought about them. Now, uh, before we jump into the first one of those, I would like to mention that if you enjoyed this video, you please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, uh, there are a lot of ways that you can do that, and you can see them all at johngetsgames.com support, and I would really appreciate that. Okay, let's go ahead and start talking about these games. And the first one is called Die Quacksalber von Quinlenberg. Now, obviously, that is a German name, and I don't speak German, so I apologize for the uh, probable mispronunciation uh, there. But what's going on here is uh, each player is essentially a quack doctor, like somebody who's just like making uh, random uh, potions with various ingredients and trying to sell it to people saying it would cure this or cure that. And that's the theme of this game. But realistically, what it is, is a bag building push your luck game. So you have a bag full of ingredients and it starts off at the very beginning of the game with um, most of the ingredients being this uh, volatile white ingredient. And whenever you pull too many of those out of your bag, you uh, your cauldron is going to explode and then you will uh, not get all the benefits that you maybe would have if you had built a better potion that did not explode in your face. And so what, the way this game works is everybody is going to be um, kind of synchronously and uh, hypothetically, uh, um, uh, simultaneously, uh, pulling tokens out of their bag and putting them into their cauldron as ingredients. And you can stop at any point in time, but of course, if you pull too many out, then it'll explode. And uh, once you um, finish, uh, once you decide to stop or explode, then you can look down to your cauldron and figure out how many victory points you're getting, first of all, and then how much buying power you're getting as the secondary thing. And that's going to allow you to get new ingredients and you put those into your bag and then you go ahead and do this thing again and you pull out hopefully the new ingredients that will do bigger and better things for you. Now, some of the ingredients have ongoing effects, or, or I guess uh, mid-potion uh, effects, where as soon as you pull it out, it does something, like uh, maybe it doubles the next token that comes out, or maybe it lets you draw a couple tokens out of the bag and inspect them and then use one of those, or uh, various things like that. And then some of the other potion, uh, some of the other ingredients, that is, will give you end-of-round scoring, like based off of how many of those tokens you brought out, or do you have more of this kind of token than your two adjacent neighbors, and that kind of thing. So you're trying to consider all of those things, and the more stuff you put into your cauldron, the more victory points you get and the more buying power you get. And um, another thing to keep in mind is that these uh, ingredients have numbers on them. Uh, the number goes one, two, and four, and that number tells you how far around this spiral of your cauldron you're going to put that token down. So obviously a four is going to fill up your potion a lot more than a one value token would. So at this point, I've actually played this game four times over the last three weeks, which is a lot more than I normally play a game for the first time, especially for these, you know, initial impressions vlogs. Um, and I think that there is a lot of exciting stuff going on here. Like I, in general, in the past, I've really enjoyed uh, Push Your Luck games. I think I'm cooling on Push Your Luck a little bit as I go into the future, as I enjoy more Euro-y style uh, uh, experiences. But I do enjoy the thrill of Push Your Luck. Uh, I, of course, don't like it when things explode in your face, but fortunately in uh, Quacksalver, the, the penalty is not too horrible. Essentially, if it explodes, then you get to take your victory points or your buying power instead of taking victory points and buying power. So you obviously don't want to explode because, you know, early in the game, you probably forego the points in order to get buying power to build a better bag. And later in the game, if it explodes, well, you just don't get to put a couple extra tokens in, which you might not actually pull out in the next round. So you maybe just take those points and not actually buy some extra stuff. So it's not that big of a deal, but it is fun. It's just, it's fun to pull these tokens out. And uh, one thing that I've noticed is that the designer of this game is Wolfgang Warsh, and uh, he has designed several games suddenly. Uh, he has not been designing games for that long, uh, but many of them have been nominated for the uh, Spiel des Jahres. Um, this one was nominated for the Kenner Spiel, but he also designed The Mind, which is nominated for the uh, just regular Spiel des Jahres. And he also designed Ganshun Clever, which is nominated for the Kenner Spiel. So he is uh, really exploded onto the scene. And I've played all three of those games. And what I've noticed about his style of games um, from the ones that I've seen so far is he's very good at creating high moments, like, like uh, where the emotion is high and like the peak is just like explosive. Like, you know, you like you jump up, you're like really happy. Uh, and that can happen in um, Ganshin Clever when you have, um, you fill something in on your pad and then it, it bounces around. You get a bonus for this and you get a bonus for that. And you get a bonus for this. It just keeps giving you these endorphin hits. In the mind, you are trying to telepathically simultaneously play cards in order. And when it works, it is a wonderful feeling. Like you all high five around the table and it's a really high sensation. And in Quacksalber, you get that as well because a lot of these tokens, uh, these ingredients, when you pull them out, they do stuff based off of the last ingredient. So it's random. Like you can't 
pick which ingredient is going to come out next. But when you have a combo go off that you're trying to make happen, like whenever you pull out a mushroom right after one of these volatile things, and that means that the mushroom is going to go really far forward, or you pull out a really big thing after something that doubles the space that the next thing goes, that's a great moment. Like It feels like um, that baked into these designs are just lots and lots of great moment possibilities. And throughout my four plays of this game, I've had lots of great moments. Uh, I've seen um, that by and large, uh, people have uh, enjoyed this one. I think uh, there's been uh, a lot of fun to be had around the table and lots of people saying like, I'm enjoying this more than I thought I would, or just like, like, wow, this is fun. Uh, the, the biggest thing that we've uh, bumped into as far as like an issue with the game so far is that you can have fall behind losers. Like it is very possible to go into the last round of the game. By the way, you do, you brew nine potions. So you do this nine times throughout the game. You can go into that last round and realize that you have no chance at winning. So maybe you're just kind of going for a second or third place, but you look to the scoreboard and you just see how far ahead the, the, the winning person is. And you look to where you are and odds are good. They're really far ahead because they have a really good bag full of ingredients. So maybe they'll get incredibly lucky, like intensely lucky and explode after pulling out almost nothing. But <laughs> like it, it, there are situations where you can math it out. And even in that case, you might not be able to win. Fortunately, this game takes about 45 minutes to play. So if you are in a situation where you don't have a shot to win near the later ends of the game, later parts of the game, it's not that big of a deal. And uh, yeah, we, we've, we've really enjoyed it. I guess there is one other thing I'd like to mention, and that has to do with a catch-up mechanic. Like I just said that you can kind of have fall behind losers, but the game does try to help you out because on the scoreboard, there are these little rats <laughs> in different spots. And at the beginning of every round, you check to see how many rat tails are between your score and the person who's winning. And that number of tails is gonna be how far you actually start ahead inside your cauldron. You essentially start with it pre-filled up with rat tails, which I guess are a good thing in this scenario. So it, the game definitely knows, I think, or the designer knew that uh, there was a potential for runaway leader type things in here. So they put a little bit of a break on that to try and let people who are falling behind have a chance to try and get back in. But it's not a heavy handed catch up mechanism. So it only does so much for you. So yeah, either way, I think that's everything I have to say about Quacksalber. Um, I probably won't be playing it again uh, for the next month or so. Like I've enjoyed my four plays of it and I do think I will get more plays in. But um, after playing it so much, I'm looking to play some other stuff soon. Um, but I will be coming back to this one. It's just a fun time. Okay, next up we have game number two, which is Gearworks. Now this was sent to me by Peacekeeper Games, who are the publishers of this one. And this is a pretty neat game where players are trying to vie for control of these rows and columns in a grid in the middle of the table. Now there are, I believe, four rows and five columns, and everybody has a hand of cards, and each card has a number on it, as well as a color. Now, when you, it's your turn, all you're going to do is play one of the cards from your hand out into an empty spot in the grid, and uh, you're going to do three full rounds. And at the beginning of each round, the grid is mostly empty. So it's going to start filling in as people are playing. And the restriction is that the number on that card must um, go into that row and make sure that the row either is ascending with their numbers or descending with their numbers. Uh, you can have duplicates next to each other, I believe. And the other uh, restriction is that each column cannot have more than one card of a specific color. So it's kind of puzzly in the way you're trying to figure out where you're going to put these cards down into the spot that will make sense for where you are. But in addition to that, you have the ability to gain sparks. Now, these are the currency of the game, little electrical sparks. I think the theme is uh, very steampunky in this way. And when you put a card down, if you look to the orthogonally closest adjacent cards and you're able to add two of them or subtract two of them from each other to match the value of the card you just put down, then you will gain a spark. And sparks are really good in this game because they might allow you to uh, draw more cards into your hand so that you can go deeper into the round. They also might allow you to play your card on top of a card that's already been played. So there's a lot of versatility that comes from these sparks. So you are really trying to make sure you're putting these cards down in such a way that you can add two numbers together to make that or subtract two numbers to make that work. Uh, now, what you're trying to do uh, every time you put these down is also vie for control of the rows and the columns, as I mentioned before. And the way that works is every row and column has a gear. And this game is called Gearworks. And whenever you put a card down into a spot, then you're going to find the gear that's associated with that row, and you're going to spin it so that the, your player color is pointing down that row. And then you'll find the column, and you'll spin that gear so that your color is pointing down that column. This essentially means that you now control that row and that column, but as soon as anybody else plays a card to that row or column, then they're going to spin the gear around and now it's going to be their control. 
So it's kind of like um, whoever was last in each row in each column is going to be the one who controls it at the end of the round. And you're just going to keep playing until uh, everybody passes. And you're going to pass because you might not be able to play cards. Um, if you pass, you can actually jump back in. It costs you a spark, but this allows you to maybe stall out and then try to jump back in at the right moment to maybe spend a couple sparks to put a card down on top of somebody else's card to then spin the control back around. And the reason you're trying to get control of these things is because the person who wins every single row and column is going to get a specific resource. Now, there are nine resources in the game, and everybody has these victory point cards that require one resource from the row section and one resource from the column section. And after every round, you're just trying to have those two things to match up to get the points for it. And if you have one of the two, then you get points for it as well. And you get points just for taking tokens that don't match up with these cards at all. But that is the real crux of this game is trying to puzzle all that out. Now, I've played this once, and we played it at four players, and it worked pretty well. I think it took us about an hour to play, and I quite enjoyed the decisions I was making while I was playing it. I didn't realize just how um, important the pacing and tempo of this game was until we were uh, pretty far into the game. Um, by, by that, I mean... At the beginning of the round, it's easy to throw cards around. There's lots of spots all over the place. But you want to make sure that you're holding back the right card for the right moment to place down into a row or column to probably finish out that row so that you take control in such a way that you are also hopeful that nobody can cover up one of the other cards to take that back. So it, it kind of feels like um, you're you're in a pool that's that's freezing. <laughs> you know, like you can swim all over the place early in the round, but as it gets colder and colder, things get more and more rigid until it locks down, everybody passes, and then that's going to be how you score the round. And I really enjoy that aspect to it. Um, this is definitely a thinky game, although I don't think it was... Um, crazy crunchy, like analysis paralysis was not too bad as we were playing it. Um, I do feel like it probably would have been better at three players because of downtime. Uh, like I said, AP wasn't excruciating, but there was a lot to think about. And I think having just two people between your turns would probably be a little bit more beneficial. Uh, I would play it at four players again, though. I thought that was um, pretty darn good. And there is also a uh, catch-up mechanism where at the end of every round, People are going to gain these sparks based off of how um, many uh, fewer uh, resources they took in the previous round. So if one person has a huge round, then everybody else is going to start the next round with tons of sparks, which means they're probably going to do really well. And it's, it was kind of a slingshot thing. When we played it, the first round, I dominated. I got almost all the points. And in the second round, I scored nothing. And in the third round, I scored almost nothing as well because uh, my opponents were able to kind of slingshot back and have so much control with all of these sparks that they used to spend to get more cards and they could cover things up and really be in the much more dominant position in the second and third rounds. Uh, now, this is not a criticism of the game. I think I probably played it quite poorly because I was not really understanding the dynamic nature of waiting until later parts in the round to put these cards down. I think I dominated in that first round mostly out of luck because none of us really knew what we were doing at that point. But I think there is some pretty cool stuff here. Uh, I'm looking forward to playing this one again. I don't think I'm like rabidly excited to, but I do think this one will see more play. Um, it's an enjoyable co uh, competitive puzzle. And uh, yeah, it was just a fun time. All right, next up we have game number three, and this one is Lowlands. Now, I'm going to start this thing off by saying that this was the best game that I've played over this last month, and I've only played it once, and it was just a couple days ago, and um, when you first hear about it, you're probably not going to be particularly excited, because when you see the name, Lowlands, that doesn't really do much for you. You look at the box cover, and it's got a big sheep on the front, and you're like, okay, there's sheep in these Lowlands. I don't really know what that is. And then you'll notice that the uh, the designers, this is their first game. I think it's a husband and wife duo, um, C and J Parton. I believe it said on the box, and, but the box cover does say that it's Uwe Rosenberg approved, and the more you learn about this game, the more you're going to say, wow, this really sounds like an Uwe Rosenberg game, because what you're trying to do is breed a bunch of sheep while trying to build a dike to stop the ocean from coming in and drowning your sheep. Now, that is the uh, the basic crux of this game. And so it sounds like a typical Euro in a lot of ways. And I do love Euros. But the thing that really sets this game apart is the, the indirect player interaction that goes on here. Now, it looks like a worker placement game at first uh, because each player has three different workers, but you only ever play them onto your own board. So it really feels like an action selection type thing where you are picking and choosing from these five different things that you can do on your board. And these five things are uh, you can uh, buy or sell sheep, you can just draw more cards. You can also help build the dike. You can uh, build fences because you need to put your sheep in pastures or else they will run away. And lastly, you can build uh, buildings and features. Now, these are tiles that come into your little player board area, 
and they will give you um, one-time benefits as well as potentially ongoing things. And you can put these into your area to try and piece together a nice little engine that's going to work for you. Now, this is a very streamlined game in a lot of ways. There are only three resources, and there's a lot of hand management here because you are drawing cards into your hand, and then you're using those cards to help build a dike, you're using those cards to pay for buildings, and you're using these cards to also build fences that you're going to put out into your area. And it's really important to try and figure out how best you're going to do those things because the, the indirect um, player interaction comes into play by seeing how much people are like breeding sheep and how much people are building the dike. Because every single round, and there are three rounds to the game, three overall rounds of the game, uh, the ocean is going to have a high tide moment and you need to check to see if the water is higher than the dike. And if that happens, then people are going to start taking these dike breach tokens, which are uh, potentially really bad for you. But if the water holds, if the dike holds and the water stays back, then people are going to get uh, coins, which are victory points in this game. And the crux here is that in both those situations, you look to see who did the most and who did the least as far as actually building that dike out. So if the dike does not hold and it breaks, then the person who helped build the dike the most loses, they don't gain any of these negative tokens. Um, you know, they're like a hero. They're like, oh, I did my best to build this dike. But everybody else is going to take uh, these dike breach tokens equal to the distance between how much they contributed to the dike and the person who did the most. So if you barely did any, you could take a bunch of these tokens. Now, the inverse is true if the dike holds, because in this case, you see who contributed the least and they get nothing. And then everybody gets uh, coins, which are points, uh, equal to the distance between the person who did the least and the person and where they're at. So that means if you do a whole bunch of dike building and the dike holds, you could get a lot of coins from that perspective. But then there is this sliding scale in the middle of the board where every time the dike uh, fails, it's going to slide in such a way to make it so that sheep are going to be less um, uh, uh, they're worth less points at the end of the game, and the uh, aid that you put into building the dike will be worth more points. And if instead the dike holds, then it shifts the other way, and suddenly sheep are worth more points, and helping build the dike is worth less. So what that means is you can't go into this game and say, I'm just going to do a dike building strategy, because that's what I'm going to do, and that's how I'm going to play this one. Because if you do that, and everybody else helps build the dike enough so that it holds every single time, your dike points could be worth zero points at the end of the game if it holds every single time. So that's definitely not something you want to invest in. In that case, you probably want to make sure that you are also breeding sheep because sheep can definitely be worth points. And the more often that the dike holds, the more points those sheep are going to be worth. And the inverse is also true because... Um, if uh, people are just going, uh, you don't want to say I'm going to breed sheep like crazy and just ignore the dike because if the dike doesn't hold, you could be in a really bad situation. And that is what happened in the first game that, uh, and only game that I played of this so far. Uh, as we were playing the game, the water rose pretty quickly. Like you, you can see how much water is going to be coming in within a range. And it was coming in really hard early on in the game. And I realized that I was probably going to focus on trying to build the dike, but also breed some sheep as well. But a couple of my opponents just went crazy on breeding sheep, and they didn't do anything for the dike essentially throughout the whole game, which meant that the dike um, failed all three times it was checked. And because I contributed the most of the dike, I never took any of these negative tokens, so my modest amount of sheep were not worth that many points each, but I got to keep all of them. But at the end of the game, if the dike fails at the very end when the storm comes, then everybody has to kill one of their sheep for every one of those dike breach tokens that they've taken throughout the game. So that meant that a couple of my opponents, between the two of them, they lost like 43 sheep. <laughs> like One person lost like almost 30, another person lost like in the, the low to mid-teens. And that just washed away their score literally because these sheep are worth points at the end of the game and they went so hard and these sheep bred like crazy because at the end of each one of these sub rounds, and there are six of those in the game, every two sheep are going to make another sheep. So that means if you have five sheep, you're going to get um, two more sheep. But if you have 10 sheep, you're going to get five more sheep. So they multiply like crazy if you're able to actually put them into your fence areas in your spot. So if you're going with a sheep strategy, you have to obviously invest a ton of time building fences and moving fences and around in such a way to hold these sheep and then buy buildings and features that can hold more sheep um, because you have a regular cap of just one sheep per tile spot on your area. Um, so in that case, I just went crazy on the dike and I ended up winning the game even though I had almost no sheep at the end. But the person who came in a close second did a little bit of both. And I think that's one of the... The, the things that has me so hopeful about this game being great long term, because my first impression is that it was great, but I don't know how it's going to uh, play out in the future, is that it seems like going with a mixed strategy is usually going to be the right way to play this game. And it's going to be all about figuring out 
how mixed a strategy that's going to be. Like, is it going to be 60% uh, cheap and 40% uh, dike building? Or is it going to be 90% dike building and 10% cheap? And every single time you play this game, it's going to be different. And you have to feel out the table and you have to feel out the game. Like, is the water coming in really fast? If it is, then you should probably tilt towards building more dike spots. If the water's coming in really slowly and we're having no problem building up enough dike to hold it back, then you better breed some sheep or else you're gonna have no chance of winning. And at the end of the day, the person who bounces out that out correctly and finds the right uh, um, uh, spot for it is gonna be the one who wins. And I think in the game that I played, it was kind of like 80% dike building, 20% sheep, and that proved to be victorious for me. But one person went kind of like 70% uh, uh, dike building and 30% sheep, and they, they almost won the game as well. Uh, so it was really close to the end, and it was just really exciting. Like, I really enjoyed all of that interaction that was going on as I saw my opponents just not building the dike and me being excited to try and keep building it to get my distance between them and myself even bigger because that meant every single time I did that, they got more of these dike breach tokens, which meant that they were going to have to have more of their sheep be drowned at the end of the game, which meant they didn't get points. And Oh man, it just really worked out well. And it just feels like this game is highly streamlined. Like it feels like it was very well developed. It wouldn't surprise me if they had four resources at one point and if there were more than just sheep, if there were more animals. Um, but it seems like all of those things have been cut away to just be a very polished and sleek design. And it just seems to work so well. And again, this is after only one play and I'm really looking forward to playing this one more. But um, I've just been overall very impressed with the decisions they made and the tension that uh, appeared on the table. It just felt like a new experience to me and I am very much looking forward to playing this one more. At this point, let's now cover game number four, which is Luxor. Now, this was designed by Rudiger Dorn, and he has designed lots of games, <laughs> including um, uh, Karuba, as well as Montana, uh, and many others that are not coming to my mind immediately right now. But um, he is a well-known designer who does some really good stuff in design spaces, and for the most part, his games are light to light medium, if that makes sense. Like, I've never really seen a intense, uh, in-depth, Euro-crazy game uh, brought by Rudiger Dorn, and Luxor is no exception. Uh, in this game, players are racing through a spiral pyramid, trying to pick up as many re um, uh, treasures as they can, just looting this pyramid, I suppose. And the key to this game is an interesting hand management idea, where you always have five cards in your hand, and you're only ever allowed to play a card that is on the outside of your hand. So you always have two cards that are an option for you. You. And those cards have numbers on them, which tell you how far you can move one of your little uh, looters throughout this pyramid. Um, and sometimes there are other benefits on that card as well. Like maybe it'll move all of your people on the board, or maybe it'll let you roll a die. And then that's part of the option of how far you can actually move forward. And then once you're done playing that card, you'll only have four cards in your hand left. And then you draw a card and you put it right in the middle of your hand. So it kind of splays your hand out. So your cards are just constantly sorting to the left and the right in your hand. And that means that there's definitely some planning um, things going on here where you can see what your options are this turn. And if you did this, well, then you could do that on this turn. And then maybe you could do that in this other spot to try and get your people around. Because it's not just about landing on a spot to take a piece of treasure. You have to get there with enough of your uh, people. Uh, most of these tiles require at least two of your little adventuring looter guys on top of that spot. So you have to work it so that you get one on there and then another one there before your opponents are able to do the same thing. The first person to get that uh, the correct set of number of people on that spot is going to take the tile. So you are racing to try and do that, but also racing to get deeper and deeper into the pyramid because the farther you go the fa uh, and the faster you go, the uh, quicker you will unlock more people. They're kind of scattered throughout the pyramid. Um, so you are going to get more people that start back at the staircase. And so the people are running in and then new people are coming in and running in and new people are kind of running in. So it's this crazy like spiral of uh, looters running all throughout this pyramid. Um, and then once uh, two people get to the very center, then the game is going to be over and you count up your points. But how far you got your people into the pyramid is also going to be worth points to you. And on top of all this stuff, you have a couple other things that you can do. Uh, for instance, there are spots that will kind of jump you forward, almost like the slide in Sorry, if you ever played that game. Uh, but there are also some more powerful cards that you can draw when you land on certain spots, which will give you more effective actions as you play these cards out. And interestingly enough, those go into the discard pile, and then you shuffle the discard pile, and suddenly everybody could just randomly draw one of those more powerful cards. So it seems like the overall game state becomes, everybody becomes stronger as you go deeper into the game, because that deck of cards that you're drawing from has more 
four more of these special cards in there. And uh, I played this one once and I enjoyed the experience. I, I think I came in last, so I don't think I did very well, but it's a very light game and it plays very fast. And um, I guess I say it's very light, but there were definitely decisions. Like there were multi-turn plans that I was making to try and get my people on the certain spot and look around and decide, is it possible that my opponents might get there first? Because you don't want to invest a couple turns trying to make something happen just to realize one of your opponents gets there one turn too soon. And now you've wasted those turns because this is effectively a race game as you're racing to get to the center of this pyramid. And I just... I found it to be quite enjoyable. Like that's just a thing that I've I've noticed for most of Rudiger Dorn's games that the decisions are pleasant and usually interesting and usually not too complicated. And I usually walk away from one of his games saying that was fun, <laughs> and I definitely had that experience here. Now I haven't played it again, um, and part of that's because I haven't played that many games. Obviously, over this last month, I'm only covering six for this vlog. But also, I've you know played um, uh, Quacksalber four times, and I've been playing more excited to maybe play some other stuff first. But I do see myself coming back to this one, uh, hopefully on numerous occasions in the future, because it played uh, in under an hour, and it teaches very quick. And yeah, sometimes you just want to play a game where you play a card, you move a person, and in 30 seconds, it's your turn again. Because sometimes it would lock down a little bit as somebody tried to plan out a thing. But for the most part, it was play a card, move a person, 10 seconds later, they played a card, moved a person, and just kind of briskly went around the table. Um, oftentimes, it was your turn before you even realized it, and I definitely enjoyed that aspect to it. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about Luxor. It's not exactly burning down my game shelf uh, with excitement, but I hope to see it get played again soon. Okay, next up we have game number five, which is Minara. Now, this is a cooperative tower building game, and I bought this one from Germany. I don't think it currently has US distribution, but it did have English rules in the box. Now, what's going on in this game is you have a bunch of different colored uh, columns, and they're about yay tall, so definitely uh, not short in this game. And when it's your turn, you are going to um, draw a card from the top of one of these challenge stacks. There are easy, there's an easy stack, a medium stack, and a hard stack, and when you flip that over, it's gonna tell you how many columns you need to add to the structure that's in the middle of the table, or perhaps how many columns you need to move from the structure to higher points on the structure. There's a couple different ways this works, but you are just constantly trying to put these down onto the different spots. And on each one of the, um, the tower levels, there are these locations that are colored, and you have to put a uh, column down onto a matching spot on the tower. So as you are building this thing up, it's gonna get more and more precarious, and every time you complete one of the tower um, levels, you have to take another level and put it down somewhere on the table. So you really have to be smart about when you actually put that last column down onto one of the floors, because you can look down and see what the next floor is gonna be. It's a randomized stack, and you have to make sure that you're in a situation where you can actually put that down onto something good, because you wanna make sure you have a stable tower that you are building throughout the game. Because the way it works is you're gonna keep playing until the tower falls over, or until you put every tower into this, uh, every tower level into this tower. Uh, also, you will keep going until maybe you run out of the uh, columns in the bag. And once you end the game through one of those means, you check to see if you actually won the game. And you win the game by making sure your tower is a certain height. And at the start of the game, you have a goal height, which might be like three or four. And then every time you cannot successfully achieve one of those challenges that you do in your turn, you put it face down on top of that area to show that you now have another level that you have to go up. So it's really important. You don't want to pull a challenge and then not have the correct columns to be able to go into the spots to be able to meet it because obviously the difficulty is gonna ramp up and you're gonna to have to get this tower higher and higher on your table the more times you mess up in those ways. But you're also able to put these uh, tower levels onto the table itself to kind of go for a wider base. But every time you do that, you also increase the difficulty. Now, this is, as I said, a fully cooperative game. And uh, the rules as written say that if the tower, parts of the tower fall down, then you could still win if enough of the tower still matches that criteria. But that kind of lends itself to a situation where you might intentionally knock over part of the tower to end the game and find yourself in a winning situation for the rest. So I've kind of ignored that rule. I don't really want to play with that rule. And I just want to say, if any of the tower pieces fall, then you just lose and it doesn't matter. And at this point, I've played the game twice now over the last couple of weeks, and I had fun with it. I think it's a, a fun uh, challenge for everybody around the table. There's definitely dexterity going on as you're trying to put these columns down, sometimes on precarious spots. Uh, also, sometimes you have to pull a column out, almost Jenga style, from it's been previously placed, and you have to make sure that it's not load-bearing, and you just carefully pull it out and put it higher up on the tower. And the pieces, as you can see, are um, a variety of wacky shapes, and the tower that you build can be very aesthetically pleasing. 
Now, I've played this game twice. I think the first game we played on medium difficulty, or the normal difficulty, that is, and we failed, but we really did not build our tower well. We essentially built two towers next to each other, and then eventually one of them fell over. Uh, so really, what I took away from that is that you need to build your tower in a cross-supporting way, so that you maybe build up here, and then put a piece across there to kind of cement these two towers together and then you kind of want to work your way around so that it branches out. And the second time I played it, it was with um, some people who uh, were relatively new to gaming and I decided to just play on easy because they were a little bit nervous about the dexterity aspect of the game. And we ended up building a really cool tower that um, branched across different ways in a lot of different uh, styles. And we did a lot of planning. We did a lot of discussing about what was the right place to put all these different things. And we ended up winning the game. Uh, we won somewhat easily. And I guess we were playing on easy mode. So in the future, I think I won't play with that anymore now that I have a good grasp about how to build a good tower in the middle of the table. But this is just a very aesthetically pleasing game. Uh, like, I was at a game night when this was played, and every new person who showed up was like, what is going on over there? <laughs> like, they go over and look at this awesome tower that we had been building from nothing. You know, it has such um, tiny, uh, such a tiny start, just, you know, a couple pieces of cardboard on the table. And at the end of the, the game, you have this wonderful massive structure. And I just found it to be very... Uh, satisfying. And yeah, I don't think this one's going to get played all the time because not everybody is into dexterity cooperative games, but I think that I will be looking forward to playing this one as kind of a medium filler uh, on several occasions going forward, especially uh, depending on the play group that I'm playing with. Uh, it took us about 45 minutes to play, so it's not super fast, but I was very happy with how it played out, and I'm looking forward to playing this one more just because this has got a good, raw, fun, and satisfaction power to it as you're building this thing up and hopefully uh, winning in the end of the day. All right, we've reached the sixth and final game we'll be talking about today, and that one is The Little Flower Shop. Now, this one was created by Dr. Finn Games, and they sent this to me a few months ago, and I've been meaning to get this one played, uh, and I'm happy that I finally did, because what's going on here is everybody is trying to compete to make the best-looking window display for their little flower shops. Now, each person has a board that's in front of themselves, which shows the window and the shelf and some hanging spots that you could put some stuff in. And it's a rather large thing, honestly. You put it on the table and everybody has these big window displays that they're building. And then the mechanic of the game is hand drafting. So it's kind of similar to Sushi Go in that at the beginning of every round, you're going to draw a certain number of cards and then everybody is going to simultaneously pick one card and then pass the rest. And then once everybody's picked, you reveal it and then you put that card down somewhere in your area. Now, that card could be a variety of different things. It could be a vase, which you will put into your window. It could be a set of flowers, which you have to put into a matching vase. Uh, it could also be a hanging basket of flowers, which you could put up in the top of your window, but you have to spend money on those. And another thing you could draft is actual money that you just put into your cash register. Um, I think the last thing that you can pull out of um, the drafting phase is an order, and that will allow you to sell some of the flowers that you've drafted earlier and you can get even more money by selling flowers in a matching vase. So that's gonna get you the money that you can then spend getting these hanging baskets in your window. And all of these things are gonna give you flower power, which are victory points in this game. Uh, and you can see that by the number of petals kind of on the floor around the vases, and the baskets themselves just tell you how many points they're gonna be worth. And so what you're trying to do is match all these things together because um, every flower goes into a specific type of vase. Like the vase has a restriction on it. And sometimes it just restricts you on how many flowers can be in the bundle that goes in. But sometimes it's even more strict than that. It says it has to be, you know, a blue flower and a white flower. And then you have to draft exactly that card that has a blue flower and a white flower on it because you can never put multiple flower cards into a specific vase. So you are definitely trying to keep track of the cards that you've seen throughout the draft because it will come back around to you around the table. So you might try to draft a vase hoping that the flower that matches it is going to come back around. Or maybe you remember you seeing that flower in an earlier uh, phase of this drafting and you hope to see that one come back into your area. Now, obviously, that would be a lot of memory brain power and you do not need to play this game uh, with that intensity. And I certainly didn't. Uh, we played this one uh, four players, I believe, and it took us probably about 30 minutes, so it's not a particularly long game. But all of us seem to enjoy the game quite a bit, especially aesthetic from an aesthetic perspective. Like, you really are putting together all of these big faces with these flowers, and from a theme uh, perspective on the aesthetics, it's unusual, right? <laughs> you're building window displays of flowers. Like, that's a lot different than Sushi Go, for instance, where you're just getting different pieces of sushi and doing some set collection. Uh, in this game, you aren't doing set collection. You're doing 
tiny little um, combos to get you points because at the end of the game, if any of your vases are empty, then you have to throw it in the trash and you lose uh, flower power points for things that are in your trash. So you certainly don't want to do that. Uh, and in fact, everything in your storage, which is another place you can put stuff, um, is going to go into your trash. But I also like the fact that you have a storage. So when you draft those flowers, you might not have a vase for them yet, but you can put them into storage and then pull them out at any point later on in the game. You can freely move things between storage and your window display, which makes a lot of thematic sense. So at the end of the day, I don't think that the little flower shop is doing anything in particular that's like gigantically new, but it did come together to be a very pleasant and pleasurable um, hand drafting experience. And I guess from a mechanical perspective, there's one tiny thing that they did new for this genre that I liked. And that is that when you get to the end of the round, um, obviously there's one card left and you pass it to the next person and they just get that card. Well, you are given the option of spending two of your money to instead discard that card and just draw the top card from the deck and then put that into your area, potentially into storage or into your window. And that gives you a decision for that final round. You don't just take the dregs of what other people had. You have the option of potentially spending a couple money if you have it to take another random card, which will, obviously you're going to do that if the card you get is bad, then going for a random card off the top of the deck is a good thing to gun for because the odds are much higher that you're going to find something that you can work with. So yeah, I think that's pretty much everything I have to say about this one. Um, I, I'm not particularly uh, crazy excited to play this one again, um, mostly because I don't play hand drafting games all that often, but I do think that it will be played again in a um, filler type atmosphere when we want to play a game that's maybe 30 minutes before people show up. Uh, because yeah, when you're playing this game and I look around, you're just gonna see a lot of smiles as people are um, not making crazy hard decisions, but just enjoying the experience of putting these vases and these flowers together. And at the end of the game, you look down and you have this nice uh, window dressing in front of yourself and hopefully yours is gonna be the best out of everyone. So yeah, I think that's everything I have to say about this one. Okay, with that, we've now reached the end of the vlog. Uh, I hope you enjoyed hearing about these six new games that I played throughout this month. Uh, I've been getting a ton of new games over this last three to four weeks, and I've only played some of them. So I'm hoping to get more new stuff played for the next one of these impressions vlogs. Although, if I'm being honest, it probably won't be more than six games. I have a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, so I won't have as many opportunities to play board games over the next few weeks as I'd maybe normally like to. But there should be some new ones that I'm looking forward to talking about. In particular, there's a game called Pastelli that I really want to try, and uh, Race to the Newfoundland. Uh, those both came in, and they're both sitting on my game shelf. They both really want to get played, and so hopefully I can make that happen in the next four weeks so that I can talk about it in the next one of these vlogs. But for now, I think we've come to the end. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support these videos, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.